beautiful co-creators, Lilu here, and today I'm with Gary Zuka at the Conscious Life Expo. Hello, Gary. Hello, Lilu. It's such a delight to spend this moment with you. I'm glad to be here. <laughs> what would you like to talk about? <laughs> <laughs> You're so used to interviews. This one has been, I, heard, I read 34 times on, uh, with the Oprah show, on the Oprah show. You are used to this. You're used to this and you've been sharing passionately your message for so many decades. Do you know, it's not that I'm used to this, as though this is something that keeps happening all the time. Every time it's different. Yeah. Every time. And you know why? Because I'm talking with someone different each yeah. time. Yeah. And that makes a different interaction, different questions, different intelligences and energies interacting. And uh -huh. that's why I'm excited each time. Good. And that's so important. We take life sometimes so much for granted, you know? and. And uh, we seem to have the same life every day, but really we could recreate it. That's exactly right. And I did that for a long time. Took everything for granted. Yeah. It's not, a, it, it's not an exciting way to live. It's, it's not, not a, a juicy, juicy way to live. <laughs> <laughs> I love it. <laughs> what is for your juicy life then? This is it. This is it, yeah. yeah. Sharing your message, sharing your soul. Yes, and hearing other people and where they are and what they're doing and... and uh, looking at what their aspirations are and also looking at what their fears are. Uh -huh. I like to look at that in me uh -huh. and I like to be able to choose the love rather than the fear. Yeah. That's my practice mm -hmm. and I love to help people who are interested do that as well. That's wonderful. So how did you get from being a Harvard graduate to where you are now and getting interested in the in the soul and you, you founded the, the Soul Institute in 90 or 99? The Seat of the Soul the Institute, the soul. yes. I did that with my spiritual partner, Linda Francis, yes. whom I hope you get a chance to interview sometime. Yes. And how did I get there from Harvard? Yeah. It wasn't a direct route. It went from uh, Kansas to Harvard to the U.S. Army to Vietnam to back to the United States and a lot of activities that are very different than my activities now. Uh -huh. I used to ride motorcycles, I used to be emotionally violent, I used to be a sex addict, wow. I used to do things that um, I thought were what I wanted to do, but none of those things would really give me the fulfillment and yeah. the joy that I'm experiencing now. And it's not a straight line. So uh, the first step, I think, for me was when I wrote a book called The Dancing Wooly Masters. Mm -hmm. yeah. And it, was about, it is about physics, but I'm not a physicist. I've never liked science and I never wrote a book. And this book became very popular and very successful and that a lot of people read it and they're still reading it. And in the process of writing that book, I discovered new things. Yeah. Uh, before, I was always worried about the monthly miracle of the rent and whether it would happen yeah. again. I was always looking for sex. Mm -hmm. I was angry. I was jealous. Mm -hmm. I was doing things that I thought would make me manly and mm -hmm. admirable. Mm -hmm. But while I was writing this book, I forgot all of that. And all I wanted was to get back to the book, to uh, keep exploring what is quantum physics. Mm -hmm. And I stumbled onto that. Well. Really, if you look at things the way I feel is a more impersonal perspective, you don't stumble onto things. You're given opportunities. And sometimes you see them, you recognize them, and you take them. Other times you don't see them, you don't recognize them, you don't take them, and then more opportunities come. This one I saw and I took. And it, you were drawn to it. You were possessed by it. That's how, what it sounds like. Not so much possessed, but energized by it. Yeah. Excited but by it. Was it was an, an, an energy, a power, a force. You were called to do this. You had to do it. Perhaps you could say it that way, but it didn't feel that way to okay, me. Okay. What it felt to me was just a delight yeah. and a joy yeah. and a, a something that I wanted to do. Uh -huh. And what I wanted to do was give a gift. Yeah. I wanted to give a gift of what I was learning about physics after I moved on for people like me with a liberal arts education or no education and no interest in science, but who wanted to know about quantum physics. Mm -hmm. And this was my first gift to life. Mm -hmm. Before that, mm, I love it that. was That's all for me. Yeah. And in that process, I discovered this book as it was being written. 
and I put it that way because I came to see that I'm not alone in writing it. Mm -hmm. It's not possible to co-create alone. It's mm -hmm. not possible to be alone. Mm -hmm. And this book was more intelligent than I was. Mm -hmm. It was more comprehensive in its understanding than I had. And it was funnier <laughs> than mm -hmm. I was. And so this was my first experience of authentic power, yeah. of doing something that I knew was appropriate, that made me feel complete. Yeah. I forgot to have any fears that I had plenty of before. That's authentic power. I didn't know how to name it then, yeah. but this experience is one that can be created consciously. And that's what I do with all of the events that I give or I give with Linda Francis and all the books that I've written or have written with Linda. I do my best to support people in providing tools that they can use to create authentic power, this kind of experience. And ongoingly, because this is not something that is an option now, yeah. the good news is that this wonderful, fulfilling, dynamic, loving, caring, meaningful experience is something that we need to create in order to evolve. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So do you think we can all, is there some kind of conditions to, to unleash this authentic power or do you have some recommendation for people to be at such a place? I do, I do. Uh, one recommendation would be to read The Seat of the Soul, yeah. which is a book that I wrote in 89. Another would be to read uh, Spiritual Partnership, yeah. which is a book that I just finished uh, in 2010. And the real important suggestion I have for people, if they want to change their lives, is to set the intention mm -hmm. to change your life. Mm -hmm. If you want to create a life of meaning and purpose and, and uh, love, set the intention to do it. Without the intention, mm -hmm. it's not going to happen. Mm -hmm. And then the second thing is to become emotionally aware, to develop the ability to know what you're feeling all of the time. Mm. And not only just the ability to say, I'm happy or I'm sad, but the ability to know what you're feeling in your body, in your throat area, for example, or your chest area, in your solar plexus area. What are the physical sensations? Mm. Not light, heavy, those are metaphors. I mean, uh, oh, a pleasing, warm sensation in the left side of my solar plexus area, or a tight, painful constriction about the size of a golf ball in the middle of my throat. Yeah. As you begin to learn your emotions and to experience them and be able to articulate them this way, then you're developing emotional awareness. These are a couple of things that people can do. Yeah, and this is important, as you were saying right now on the planet, to develop that and to be, to, un to, to, to express our authentic power. We are needed, we're needed to step up, aren't we? Well, yes, yes, of course. But it's not something out of a sense of duty right. to the planet yeah. or to other people. For me, changing your life is something you do because you don't want to live the kind of life that you were living before. If you were angry, if you're jealous, if you're resentful, and everybody is at one time or another, mm -hmm. if you can't stop working 12 hours a day or 10 hours a day, if you can't stop eating or drinking or watching pornography or needing sex or gambling mm -hmm. or alcohol or drugs, if your thoughts are obsessive, mm -hmm. if your activities are compulsive, and you begin to see that that's painful. Mm -hmm and it's creating painful consequences for you, yeah. and you decide you want to change that, then that is the motivation to change. And as you do, you begin to change the world. Yeah. Because you and the world are not separate. We are in a great transformation of human consciousness in which our perceptual capability is expanding beyond the five senses. Mm -hmm. That means we're beginning to see ourselves as more than bodies and minds. Mm -hmm. We're beginning to see our lives as meaningful. We're beginning to see ourselves as part of a larger tapestry of life. And we know, or we begin to sense, or we can experiment with the idea that what you change in you has impact far beyond what you might have thought, mm -hmm. far beyond what your five senses can show you. Mm. 
what would you say that so so the soul so the soul has a mission has something to be doing on this planet or really all what we need to do is is focus on the love and on focus on on, on on living in the present moment and I've well it's good to focus on love and it's good to live in the present moment but how can you do it when you're angry mm -hmm. how can you do it when you're jealous yeah how can you do it when everything falls apart and you don't know where the money's coming from yeah how do you do it when your child is ill or the person you wanted to spend your life with doesn't want to be with you yeah these are the times when you can create authentic power you don't unleash it you create it you create it and you create it with your choices uh -huh and you create it with the choices that you make when parts of your personality that are so painful that if you're not aware of them you'll act on them the way you always have in the past yeah. you live a robotic life yeah. and when you decide that you're not going to live a robotic life that instead you're going to inject consciousness into your life then you can change it then you can use these tools yeah. emotional awareness responsible choice consulting intuition and the more you challenge a part of your personality that's angry jealous vengeful any of these things I was talking about the more you challenge it consciously by becoming aware of it and deciding not to act on it uh -huh. even when you want to so much even when you feel you must mm. like you're in a power struggle yeah so what could we say to ourselves in that moment where we feel that coming up you can say, I'm not going to act this way again. You can say, I am in a part of my personality that's based in fear. It's not who I am. Mm -hmm. It's not, these experiences are not the ground of my being and unchangeable. Mm -hmm. They are a part of my personality. Mm -hmm. I have other parts that are grateful and appreciative and content and caring and loving mm -hmm. and I intend in this moment even though I feel like hitting someone or lashing out with my words or withdrawing emotionally or using my charm or my strength to manipulate them not doing it that's the work mm -hmm. awareness and volition does something happens in the body then on the on a neuroscientific level, I mean on a cellular level, when we start making small choices like that and changing, and making the decision to not react as we used to, is there physically, is there a physical also reaction or change that happens? There is a for huge, the long term? There is a huge literature on this, mind-body interaction. Yeah. And I am not an expert in that literature, but yeah. I can tell you from what I know yeah. and from what I have read on it, but what I know is more important to me that of course when you change your orientation your emotional orientation changes or your cognitive orientation changes there are physiological correlates mm -hmm. but those correlates are not causes consciousness is the cause mm -hmm. and as you change your consciousness there are physiological changes that occur in your body mm -hmm. but those you don't have to worry about making mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. they will happen mm -hmm what you can focus on is what your intention is in the moment when you're speaking with someone for example you do a lot of interviews yeah. so and and you have uh, a way of sharing these interviews so when you work in this arena that you've created you can ask yourself in the privacy of your own experience what's my intention well I know I suspect from being with you that sometimes your intention is that you want to support mm -hmm. people to become empowered mm -hmm. or to become more loving or to live more meaningful lives yes and when you are having that intention it's fulfilling mm -hmm. it's exciting mm -hmm. it's wonderful it's meditative it's meditative there may be sometimes when you find that your intention might be to satisfy now I'm just guessing because I don't know you and we've just met <laughs> but I do know that everyone that's on the earth has parts of their personalities that are very loving like these and parts of their personalities that are based in fear like course, anger like yeah. feeling inadequate like yeah. wanting to be uh, noticed mm -hmm. so 
Here, let me put it this way. I'll put it in, in the first person. Okay. The best books that I write, which I intend to be the only books that I write, are with the intention to support other people. Mm -hmm. And I have this wonderful feeling of co-creativity when I'm doing it. If ever I'm writing because I want to impress somebody, mm -hmm. or I want to think of myself as a writer, or I want to make myself feel better or more valuable or safer, mm -hmm. the writing's not very good. Yeah. I wind up throwing it away. In the moment, I don't feel that wonderful feeling of creativity with the intention to support people. The difference is that when I am writing, and it's a gift, like I said, the Dancing Willie Masters was my first gift to, to life. life. Yeah. And before that, nothing was a gift, it was all taking mm. from me. And the difference in experiences was night and day. Actually, it was bigger than that. It was love or fear. Mm. So only I can know in my own experience what my intention is. Mm -hmm. Like when I'm speaking with you now, my intention could be to share with you in the best way that I can what I know, which is my intention now. Mm -hmm. But if I, I, if I were off balance, you might say, mm -hmm. or if I were feeling insecure, my intention might be to be on an on a internet or a television interview so that I could feel more important. Mm -hmm. That would be a very different yeah. intention. <clears throat> now, if that happened to me, I would, I would strive to be aware of it, mm -hmm. and in that moment, change, change my intention. I may still feel insecure. I may still feel as though I'd like to impress somebody, but I would change myself. I would challenge that part of myself that feels insecure, that might want to impress. That means manipulating, control someone, an audience, an interviewer. And that's how I would challenge that part of my personality, by not acting on it. Mm -hmm. And at the same time, I would cultivate, by acting on it, the part of my personality that can give without second agendas, yeah. without, with no strings attached. And that is how authentic power is created. Whenever I find myself acting from a part of my personality that comes from fear and not from love, mm -hmm. and I see it, I stop acting on it. I choose to act from the most healthy, grounded, loving part of my personality that I can access. So really, in every moment, mm -hmm. we have the choice between love and fear, and that's, that's what there is. That's it. That's it exactly. But if we summarize a bit simplistically, but... That's a beautiful summarization. You've gone right to the heart of creating authentic power. Mm -hmm. It is to recognize within yourself mm -hmm. the difference between love and fear and choose love. No matter what you're feeling inside and no matter what's going on around you, mm -hmm. that's how you challenge a frightened part of your personality and you cultivate a loving part. And as you do that again and again and again, you create authentic power with each decision. Mm -hmm. Beautiful. Beautifully said too and explained. How, <coughs> so, so talking about spiritual partners, that's your latest book. How, what is the role of our spiritual partners? How do you define them? Oh, spiritual partners are very helpful in this. Yeah. Because spiritual partners are people who are doing the same thing. Mm -hmm. And so you can help one another. Mm -hmm. No one can do it for me, only I know what my intention is. And no one can change my intention for me. But a spiritual partner can help me recognize when I might be in a part of my personality that is coming from fear, mm -hmm. and I don't see it in the moment. That partner might be able to help me see it. For example, my partner might say, um, what was your intention in saying that just now? Or um, what are you feeling in your chest area or in your throat right now? The, and a spiritual partner doesn't know what I'm feeling. No one can know, really. Mm -hmm. Well, sometimes it's pretty obvious you can know what somebody feels. But a spiritual partner won't assume that what she sees is actually so 
but it's as though I have asked my spiritual partners, and actually I have, I would say, if you see anything about me that you think it would be helpful for me to see, and you think I'm not seeing it, will you let me know? And then my spiritual partner will tell me. Well, a spiritual partner is someone you've already given that permission to. When? When does that agreement take place? Whenever you decide. In this lifetime, would you say, or is that before on a soul level? Oh, in this lifetime, very much. For example, um, as you create authentic power, you begin to attract to you people who are doing the same thing. And the potential of a spiritual partnership happens. Now, if I were the way I was when I was 20 or 25, I couldn't have been a spiritual partner to anyone mm -hmm. because I wasn't interested mm -hmm. in any of these things. But now I am. And in fact, I was drawing to me people who were interested in the same things that I was. Mm -hmm. Being manly, violence, sex, motorcycles, drugs, mm -hmm. uh, being admirable. But in, in other words, there is a law of attraction. And the law of attraction is that energy attracts like energy. So as you become very creative, as you have become, mm -hmm. you draw to, your, uh, to yourself people who are creative. Mm -hmm. But if you were interested only in using people, you would draw people who are only interested in using you. Mm -hmm. If you're angry, you'll draw angry people. Mm -hmm. If you're loving, you'll draw loving people. So what's interesting though is that those, those spiritual partners are um, they uplift you, they help you to be to, exp to, to be your best self here by coming from a loving place and questioning you in a way that will just bring out the best. Sort of. How, how does this, yeah, tell us sort more about this. Spiritual sort of. Partnership. Your spiritual partner doesn't uplift you. Yeah. Do you know why? It's, it'll be ego otherwise mm. getting in the way. Because only you can uplift you. Right. When you're in a frightened part of your personality mm -hmm. and you think, oh, I don't want to get up this morning, I can't do anything right, I want to die, nothing is going right, why aren't people listening to my show, or whatever it is. Now, that's not what you're asking now, because a lot of people are, but whatever the question is, yeah. you can recognize. A friend will come to you and they'll say, oh, Lilu, it's going to be okay. You're doing just fine, don't worry about it. People are going to come and look at the show. You're going to get just the producer you want. Uh, you're going to get just the partner that you want. You're going to have just the friends that you want. Spiritual partners don't do that. Uh -huh. They don't try to make the frightened parts of your personality feel better. Mm -hmm. A spiritual partner would say, Lilu, what are you feeling now in your chest area? Mm -hmm. When you tell me that you can't do this anymore, that things are not going right and they never will. See, what are you... Um, what are you feeling in your throat area? Mm -hmm. What's your intention mm -hmm. for saying this? Do you think this comes from love or from fear? Mm -hmm. That's the big difference. Your spiritual partner will help you see what the interior dynamic in you is that is creating your experience. They won't try to change your experience. They'll try to help you use your experience to grow spiritually, to recognize the difference between fear and love mm -hmm. in you so that you can choose love, if that's what you want. And if your spiritual partners are attached to your doing what they think you should, do, they think you uh, should do, yeah. then they're pursuing external power. Mm -hmm. They're trying to change you so they will feel better about themselves. Mm -hmm. And that's not spiritual partnership. It's it's not if they don't want to change themselves. So here's the thing. Yeah, it has to come both ways then. There's spiritual, a spiritual partners, like everybody in the Earth School, have loving parts of their personality and frightened parts of their personality. So when you're in a spiritual partnership, the frightened parts are going to come up mm -hmm. because you are invoking them. Mm -hmm. You're invoking healing from the universe. Mm -hmm. And your spiritual partners will help you. And you can help them because it's not easy to experience a frightened part of your personality. Mm -hmm. It's painful. Mm -hmm. And the loving parts of your personality are marvelous to experience. They're so gratifying. They're so satisfied. They're so 
engaged in what they know and feel is appropriate. So it's a matter of having with you people who are interested in relationships of substance and depth, who are committed to changing themselves rather than changing you or the people around you. Mm -hmm. And if you are one of those people, you will draw those people. And if you decide to become spiritual partners, then you will. Now, spiritual partners have their own dynamic. Um, I suggest that our viewers mm -hmm. read a book, Spiritual Partnership, yes. yeah. because there's so many wonderful things that you can learn about it. Yeah. It's very different from a friendship. It's different from any other type of relationship that's existed in the past, because all of the relationships that we've had in the past have been relationships that have been created by a species that is limited to the five senses. Mm -hmm. But we're moving beyond that now. Mm -hmm. And we need, and we have, a new type of relationship. A partnership between equals for the purpose of spiritual growth. That is a spiritual partnership. Mm. So Linda is clearly your spiritual partner for how many years? Linda and I have been together for about 17 years. And we have been spiritual partners from the beginning. Yeah. But spiritual partnership, I want to make this real yeah, clear, yeah. is not only a couple's dynamic. Yeah. You can create a spiritual partnership in your biological family, and there it's very powerful mm. and challenging. Mm -hmm. You can create a spiritual partnership uh, with your friends, with your coworkers, with your classmates. Mm -hmm. You can create a spiritual partnership with whomever it is appropriate for you to create a spiritual partnership with. And when you read the book, you'll find that there are certain dynamics of spiritual partnership. For example, spiritual partners stay together as long as they grow together mm. spiritually. Yeah. They don't stay together just because the business is doing well, just because they have children, just because they decided that they're going to get married. They stay together as long as they grow together spiritually. And it's an energy dynamic. If one of them stops being interested in that, the relationship will come apart. Mm -hmm. And there's other dynamics. Do you know what? We have some spiritual partnership guidelines. And I would like to invite all of our viewers Great. and you to look them over mm -hmm. and see if they might be helpful to you. You mm -hmm. can get them at seatofthesoul.com. That's S-E-A-T, like what you sit on, mm -hmm. of the S-O-U-L dot com. Go there, and under free tools, there's, well, there's a lot of free tools. There's interviews, there's uh, lots of things that can support Wonderful. you. And, and so I, I invite you to take advantage of this website and print out the spiritual partnership guidelines. Because spiritual partnerships require courage, they require commitment, that's the start. Then courage, they require compassion. They require conscious communications and action. And all of these are in the spiritual partnership guidelines. And these guidelines will not help you change anyone else. They're not designed for that. They'll help you change you, mm -hmm. if that's what you want. Mm. Wonderful. This was a wonderful moment with you, Gary. Would you, is there anything else that you want to add to this conversation that we might not have said that is important to be said at this point? Or what it means? Oh, yes. You know? uh, I would like to support our viewers in every way that I can. We have a summer retreat every year. Mm -hmm. uh, in this year that you and I are speaking, it's going to be on Mount Hood out of Portland, or outside of Portland, Oregon. It's always at the end of July. It's always in a beautiful place. It's always five days. And it's always one of the most exciting events that I'm a part of. Mm. And Linda. Linda, yeah. And so if any of the things that we've said or we've talked about are appealing, mm -hmm. then come to that retreat if you want to experiment with them mm -hmm. and put them into practice with people who are experimenting with the same thing. Mm -hmm. uh, and meet spiritual partners there. Yes, exactly. <laughs> That's the whole point. Yeah. And bring your friends. Everyone's the same. Yeah. And bring your friends there or your family that you feel might be open mm. to deeper and more substantive relationships with you mm -hmm. so that when you go home, you'll have spiritual partners there and you can experiment. 
with, 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 with one another. And also, I love using technology to support people, mm -hmm. not to manipulate people, which is how it's usually used, mm -hmm. but to support people. And we do, not only with this website, but with a Facebook page and a Twitter mm -hmm. um, page that I have. So I'm always wanting to send out sure. thoughts that might be helpful, mm. that might be useful. And not only my own, I love to send them out from other people too. If yeah, I we need reminders. We need daily reminders. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. Actually, the universe gives you daily reminders right. to create authentic power or mm -hmm. not. It's every time you have a flash of irritation. <laughs> That's a reminder. <laughs> oh, cheeky little universe. <laughs> <laughs> yes, it is a wise and compassionate, and you could call it cheeky. Some people would call it cruel. Some people would call it merciless. All of these are experiences uh -huh. of compassion and wisdom because all of them stimulate in you emotions yeah. that either come from fear or come from love and require that you choose one or the other. And if you're not aware of that choice or the requirement, you will choose nonetheless. You'll choose unconsciously. You'll choose yeah. what you have in the past. Automatically. Automatically. Yeah. Habitually. Yeah. If you're an alcoholic and someone puts a drink in front of you, you'll take it. If you uh, withdraw emotionally when you become angry, you'll withdraw emotionally again mm. and create the same consequences again. Yeah. But every time you become angry or jealous or despairing, that's an opportunity for you to recognize a part of your personality that's been controlling you and you can change by challenging it, by experiencing it and not acting on it. And every time you have a loving impulse, mm. not a sentimental or a romantic experience, but a feeling of connection, of appreciation, of uh, being able to support someone without agenda, Recognize that as a part of your personality too, and you can cultivate it. You don't have to wait for it by accident to come again so you yeah. can enjoy it. You can actually cultivate that. And that's how you create authentic power, by challenging fear and cultivating love. And your entire life becomes a meditation as you begin to do this. And when that happens, you're using your life as it was designed to be used. Beautiful. What an honor to have met you, and, and thank you for sharing all this wisdom and information with the world, because this is a global conversation. This is even a universal conversation. Thank you. Exactly. You're welcome. Thank you, Gary. Okay, my beautiful co-creators. If you want to see more interviews, you can check juicylivingtour.com. Much love. Bye.